okay a very good morning to all of you on behalf of department of civil engineering college of engineering kidangur i welcome you all to the third day of our faculty development program i welcome today's first expert dr arun c emmanuel sir and i welcome srigumari miss uh, srigumari tk uh, ma'am for the welcome Wel uh, welcoming our expert srigumari miss yes am i audible yes miss okay. respected expert particip participants and dear colleagues a very good morning to one and all with immense pleasure and privilege i am here to introduce our expert for the session dr arun c emmanuel presently working as assistant manager technology and skilling well ccs limited he did his btech from nit calicut mtech from iit madras and phd from iit delhi his area of interest is in the in the domain of building technology and construction management with primary focus on construction material he was the project manager from india for a global research project which led the development of limestone calcined clay cement a low cost low carbon cement he has published five international journal papers and over 15 international conference papers he has more than 10 years of experience handling various roles and responsibilities in the industry and academia i welcome you sir for sharing your experience with us now it is over to you sir please Uh, thank you, uh, Srimati Madam and uh, Vindhya Mall Madam. Uh, I'm audible, right? Yes. Sir. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, before I start, uh, I would like to thank uh, the Department of Civil Engineering, uh, College of uh, Kedango, especially uh, head of the department, uh, Professor Matthew, for giving me this wonderful opportunity. And uh, being from an industry, it is always a pleasure to interact with ca academia once in a while. And uh, Uh, before I start the session, uh, for a better bandwidth, let me turn off the video and uh, let me share the presentation first. And in case of any interruption, please let me know. Uh, are you able to see the presentation? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes, sir. Clearly. Okay. Fine, fine. Um, let me know in case if the sound is lagging uh, behind the slide. Maybe I need to adjust it. Uh, well. No, sir. It's correct. Correct. Okay. Now it's all set. Up. Okay. Good. Yeah. Uh, the I the topic that I would like to take it is the uh the cement industry and challenges and recent advances. Well. Uh, uh, as far as the Indian academy, the Indian academy is concerned. Uh, we don't really emphasize on the material part in uh, in the graduate level courses, right? We hardly have one uh, concrete technology, and we don't really develop further on uh, the aspect of materials in terms of uh, civil engineering or construction is concerned. But although, uh, but however, it is really important for us because whatever we do is be it our design, be it our construction, it is all about materials. So it's really important for us to emphasize on different materials uh, that we actually do uh, uh, as far as the civil engineering is concerned. Where the cement is one prime material that we really need to focus. On. Does uh, the cement industry is one such an industry that we really need to focus on? That we really need to talk that we will see in this presentations. Uh, the outline of the presentation is at the very first. Uh, I'll give a very brief about the, uh, the the cement production process and the hydration mechanisms, and then we go for uh, the present and future uh, of the cement industry, particularly with the focus of India. Then we go for the present challenges and various approaches uh, to address the challenges in terms as far as an academy is concerned, 
And then once once you address the existing challenge, there could be some future challenges also that could that could potentially lead to a research opportunities. So these are the things uh, that I would like to talk about in my presentation. When you look at uh, cement, we don't really use cement as it is, right? Nowhere we don't use cement as it is. Either we mix with water and use it as a grout, or we mix, uh, in addition to the water, we also mix uh, sand to use it as a mortar. And then, apart from the cement, sand, and water, sometimes we use aggregates, sometimes we add the aggregates also, and there we go for concrete. Well, as far as concrete is concerned, we all, whether you belong to India, whether you have come from India, or whether you come from US, most of maybe 80% of our time, 80% of the time in a day, you would be spending a place that is confined with concrete, right? It could be your home, or it could be your office, or it could be somewhere else. But sometimes even 100% that you actually spend nowadays, you know, due to the COVID, even 100% of the time you would generally spend it in a concrete jungle, in a concrete confined places. Well, as far as the global production is concerned, the global usage is concerned, concrete is the most consumed man-made material in the world, and the current production rate is somewhere around 4 billion tons per year. Well, it is the second most material in the world after water, if you are actually avoiding the word man-made material. So, in that way that we can say that the concrete is the second most material in the world that has been used by the man after water. Well, what are the advantages of concrete in terms of compared with other construction materials such as wood or steel? So these things you would be already knowing it. So it has got a high compressive strength. It can be molded into shape so that you can actually do a cast in situ kind of production. Then it has got high durability, particularly uh, fire resistance when you compare with steel or uh, wood. Then it is relatively cheap uh, compared with other uh, other uh, other uh, construction materials. Uh, as far as concrete is concerned, the ingredients can be divided into a couple of categories. One is coarse aggregate. When you have the uh, uh, when you have the aggregate size is greater than 4.75 mm, uh, typically the coarse and fine aggregate is locally available. And that is the reason that concrete is actually relatively cheap because uh, you have a major part of the concrete, about 60% uh, by volume, would be of naturally available low cost material that the aggregate is either coarse or fine. Then we have the cement, the essential glue in the concrete. That comes about 15% uh, by volume. Then comes water, uh, which required to hydrate the cement, which comes around 20%. Then sometimes we add the chemical and mineral analysis that we will be talking about later. Well, coming to the cement, as you know that cement is a very fine particle. It is grayish in color. Its particle size ranges from 1 to 300 micrometer, where the micron is 10 raised to minus 6 meter. And typically, the cements are uh, hy uh, hydraulic in nature, as I said, it reacts with water. When you add water in the cement, what happens is that it reacts with water, and that reaction is called hydration reactions. And due to this hydration reaction, you form a, a couple of products that is called hydration products. And when this hydration products over the time, these hydration products uh, bonds with the aggregates, the concrete, and solidifies over the time. And there we get, uh, there we get uh, the, the the solidified uh, the concrete, and that's how uh, the entire hydration products and the cement leads to the formation of a you know denser uh, concrete, hardened concrete. So essentially. In that way, we can say that cement is the glue in the concrete and it has got the binding capability. Well, when you look at the industry overall, ordinary Portland cement, or we termed it as OPC, is the most common uh, cement that we generally use it. It is the oldest one. It has started its production somewhere around 1800 already. In the production of uh, OPC typically relates uh, two types of material. There would be calcium sources, and then there will be silicate sources. It uh, mix up together, heat up, up to around 1,500 degrees Celsius. You form clinger nodules, and then these clinger nodules run with a little bit of gypsum, grind it in a ball mill. You get the ordinary Portland cement. Now let us look at it. What are these calcium sources and what are the silicate sources material? A pretty naturally available material. The calcium source of materials are typically limestone, that is CSEO3 in chemical formula. 
when you heat the the calcium the limestone that is CaCO3 decarbonates it forms becomes CaO and CO2 it becomes uh, uh, carbon dioxide and uh, quicklime right and the CO2 it will it will uh, uh, elaborate to the atmosphere and CaO is the one that we see the calcium sources then we have a silica that is actually comes from the clay uh, which has formula, chemical formula SiO2, but typically clay does not really independent, does not completely on the silica form. It, it is an aluminum silicate, so also you all will also have a, the aluminum Al2 all three in the semen, although it does not may, not, may not be really required, but sometimes, most of the times, even almost all the time, clay does not be on a pure form. It is basically on aluminum silicate form. Then uh, we have an impurity called the iron oxide, or iron, so it actually comes from clay. Then since we add the gypsum, we also have the sulfate content in the cement in the OPC. So these are the typical uh, components that we can see it in the raw material. Let's look into uh, uh, the schematic diagram of the production of ordinary Portland cement. In general, uh, we start the production process uh, from the mice. It could be a clay mine or it could be a limestone mine. Then you use the excavator, you get a boulder type of uh, uh, boulder type of uh, uh, materials. It goes for a preliminary crusher and it, then it can go to the secondary crusher. From there, the limestone or the clay will go to the proportioning silos. Uh, the proportioning, typically, uh, as we said that, uh, as I said that, it would be 80% would be limestone and then 20% would be clay. Well, it actually depends upon the chemical composition of the raw materials. In the proportioning like silos, it will actually proportion based on the chemical compositions. Then it goes to a grinding mill where it could it make it in the ground, it could make it in the fine powder. Then it goes to a preheated uh, tower. Nowadays, almost every uh, every uh, industry, almost every production plant, there will be a preheated tower in which you use the waste heat uh, to do a preliminary heating of the, uh, of the raw material. You would be reaching up approximately 150 to 200 degrees Celsius, where you can actually evaporate all the moisture that is present in the raw materials. From there, it passes to a cement clean, in which the temperature ranges up to 1,500 degrees Celsius. You the entire decomposition of the limestone and clay occurs during this clingerization process, and then you then you in the end you get a clinger, the heated clinger, which has got a temperature around 1,500 degrees Celsius, passed through a cooling towers pass through a cooling area in which the, the residual heat will be actually utilized in the preheated tower. And then it being passed to an another proportional equipment to mix with the, the gypsum. Gypsum is mainly used for the spring out the cement. And then it go for further grinding to make it in a very fine powder cement. And then it's been transported, either it escaped in a silos or it's been transported or shipped in somewhere else where the end user is there. So this is the typical production process of OPC. But when you look at the real way, the real scenario, uh, the, the cement plants typically located near to a limestone mines because 80 percent of 80 percent of the raw materials typically generally limestone. It acts like a canvas. This is this picture represents. This picture is from a, a cement plant uh, in Gujarat by Ultratech. It's in Kowaya district. It's in Kowaya. It's like a campus. Uh, the the production rate is approximately about. Uh, 4 million ton per year. That means uh, about uh, 10,000 tons per day. So that's how the production capacity is there. Uh, it, it would be looking like a canvas where you'll have the schools, you will have uh, uh, shopping complexes, you have apartments, you will have almost every facility of a township in a very remote village. So that's how the cement plants really works. You have a Hello? Am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are very much audible. Yeah. Let us look at, as I said, that the clinker is the one that defines the entire cement. Now, let us look into that. What are the major phases that is there in the clinker? This, you must have heard it already, that uh, there are four major phases that is there in an OPC, in a clinker, and that is elite, tricalcium silicates. It comes around 50 to 90 percent of the entire uh, entire uh, clinker. Then next comes dicalcium silicate that is belite. It comes around 10 to 40 percent. Then we have aluminase, tricalcium aluminate, or simply known as aluminate. Then we have tetracalcium aluminoferrate, or simply known as ferrite. 
it comes in very very uh, 5 to 15 percent uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the composition in terms of the proposition then we also have a bit of minor phases like mco so3 and 2nk2 depending upon the impurities that is present in the raw material well it is always important to understand before we proceed further it is really important to understand the basics of cement hydration mechanisms as i said that the cement is a hydraulic material it reacts with the water let us see all these three four phases how does it react really react with the water and what are the products that has been formed well when you have the c3s or the elite reacts with the water you get this product called calcium silicate hydrate or csh in in a, in a, in a generic notation and then you have CH that is calcium hydroxide, or we also call it as a portlandate. Once again, when you react, when the when the C3S reacts with the water, you get calcium silicate hydrate and calcium hydroxide. And this is the same case in terms of C2S or the bilite also reacts with the water. You have the same similar kind of product that is CSH and CH. Although it's the actual amount of production, the amount of uh, the amount of uh, hydration products may vary. But however, the reaction kinetics, the reaction the formula of silicate phases are relatively same. Then you have an aluminate that is something react with the gypsum first and forms a product something called uh, ettringate. So over the time, it could even change into a monosulfate also. Uh, then the ferrite phase that is also in react with the similar to that of C3A, but I don't want to really explain because it's uh, basically to understand the process. So this is how a cement hydration mechanism happens uh, in a typical OPC. In a picturization, you have four types of clinger phases. Then you add up with the water, the, the blue one in the, the, the diagram shows the water phases. Over the time, what happens is that the hydration products, the CSH or the calcium hydroxide, that is relatively in compared with the, high, the clinger phases, the density of these phases are relatively low. For example, the LA10 bellate, uh, the, uh, the density is uh, 3 gram per cc or whatever it is. Where in the terms of CSS, the main hydration products, calcium silicate hydrate, the density is 2. And the calcium hydroxide is density is somewhere around 2.4. So that eventually means that you will get a better volume efficiency where you know the volume that has been filled by the water is now filled with the hydration product. So that's how you get a better binding capacity because you are actually filling up the void spaces. Uh, by the hydration products. Then you also have a bit of minor phases like uh, not really uh, uh, relatively smaller phases like uh, AFT that is called ettringate. Then you have some other phases like monosulfate. There could be a few other phases too, depending upon the chemical composition of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the impurities that is present in the uh, cement. Now let us look into uh, the statistics of the cement production all over the world and the India. Now, when we look at there's a thumb rule is called, you know, the cement production is generally depending upon two aspects. One, the development, uh, uh, the GDP or the development status of the particular country and its population. When you look at as a thumb rule, when the population growth rate is somewhere around 3x over the decades, uh, over these years, the cement production is actually on the 34x. So that eventually indicates that it, it, has, it has got a huge influence on the population as well as the GDP, for example, in the case of uh, uh, in the case of in the global standard, the cement production, the, the per capita consumption of cement is somewhere around about uh, 450 kilogram per person per year, whereas India is somewhere around 190 kilogram per person per year. Or oh, well, that eventually means that there's a still scope for it. There's a lot of infrastructure development is yet to come. There would be a lot of development is yet to come. Well, in a way that the cement production is a kind of an indicative to the economic growth of a country. Could uh, the future demand for the cement? Uh, and what are the product, the current production rate of the cement in terms of different countries is concerned? As you see that the China tops the world in terms of more than 2 billion ton per year. At percent, and India would be somewhere around 450 million ton per year. And then the other countries, other developing countries like Brazil and all, it's there. But over the years, <coughs> it has been predicted that by 2050, that within three years, we are actually, the India is actually going to overcome China in terms of cement production. And we would be the top, we would be uh, the number one country in the uh, in the world uh, in, as, as far as in terms of cement production is concerned. 
and it could be approximately thirty percent of the cement production is going to be from India within two to two zero five zero. Now, do we have when we look at this future demand? Let us look into the various challenges that the country faces in terms of cement production. The number one challenges that we're probably going to face is that, and we are already facing, is that that is the availability of quality raw materials. Well, we do have an abundant source of clay. Everywhere we have clay, the total reserve for clay is somewhere around 2700 billion ton, whereas we don't have enough limestone. We see that the major junk, the major portion of the cement production is actually limestone. But do we have enough sales source? We don't have. We have approximately around 18,000 million tons that is being, if the production is true, it is actually going to consume completely within 30, 40 years. So this could become a very critical factor as far as the development of the country is concerned. So the second thing is that, that probably we are going to face is that the high energy consumption. As I said that, you know, for the production of the clinger, for the production of the cement, it need to be heated up to one uh, 1,500 degrees Celsius, correct? And then you need to have the grinding. You need to have, if you start from the entire production process, there is an excavation, there is an extraction of the material, then there's a transportation, and then there is this uh, clinkerization process, the grinding process, then there is a further transportation of the end user. So this all require high energy consumption. And then you have the third one that is environment of the emission issues. As you have seen that the clinkerization process, the decarbonization of the limestone produces a lot of CO2 to the atmosphere. So there is a huge environmental concern as far as cement industry is concerned. Now, if we look at the CO2 emission from cement industry itself, it is responsible. The cement industry is responsible for about 7% of the global CO2 emission. And there they also produce a bit of noxious, noxious and sources. But however, it is the major junk is mostly on CO2. And when we compartmentalize this emission of CO2 that to the atmosphere, the clinkerization is the one that uh, takes the major part. About 50% of the CO2 emission from the cement production is actually from the clinkerization process, or in other way, the decarbonization of CSCO3. And then the other part comes from the burning of the fuel, and there are indirect emissions from grinding and transportation, etc. Well, when I said that one ton of CO2 is actually produces about, a, sorry, one ton of clinker is actually produces one ton of CO2, you could imagine in a ball, in a CO2 completely filled with a ball that has been diameter of 10 meter. So that's how the amount of CO2 that has been produced by cement production. This thing that we really need to address is be the availability of the quality raw material or the high energy consumption or this emission or environmental issues. And what are the various approaches that we can actually address these challenges and meet the future demand as far as with the keeping, keeping the sustainability in mind? There could be four different types of approaches. One, is there a way to replace the clinker with any other material or any other cementitious material? Or is there a way to change the production process to address any or many of these challenges? Or can we increase the performance of the clinger? Now, even the most efficient way now is the clinger it does not really react completely, that I will let you know later. And the fourth, the fourth way of approach is that is there an alternative for cement? <laughs> Once again, can we replace clinker partially or fully with any other type of material so that you can actually reduce the entire production process? You can reduce the, uh, the the natural sources. You can reduce the energy consumption. You can also reduce the emission. Or second thing is that is there a is there a change that we can actually do in the production process to address any or many of these uh, challenges that we face? Or can we actually increase the performance, the efficiency of the clinker? Or is there any alternative for cement? So these are the four ways or approaches that we are actually going to look at in the upcoming slides. Number one, is there a is there anything that we can actually replace clinger? Now that we have something called a supplementary cementitious material, then we also have an inner fillers. In both, there is something called a blended cement. We these things we will look at in the upcoming slides. SCMs is typically called a supplementary cementitious material. You might have heard about already. There is something called fly ash, a byproduct from the thermal power plant. Then there is something called the slack, and another byproduct from the ion industry. 
Then we have natural porcelain that is actually from the volcanic ash, or you can also take it as a volcanic ash. Then there is something called the calcined clay that's from processing that actually produces by a bit of processing of the, that typical general covered clay. We will see that in later. Now let us look into supplementary cementitious material or in terms of SEM or short as SEM. Supplementary cementitious material are basically naturally, it could be naturally available or it could be industrial bright products or it could be processed. Now if you look into the back, ligation slag are, are industrial byproducts. Sometimes you can also call it as an industrial waste. Then there is something called naturally available, for example, natural porcelain is naturally available. Then there is a bit of processing one that is, for example, calcium clay. But typically, uh, SCMs are aluminosilicates. If you look into this, uh, in, the, in the tertiary diagram of CAO, SAO2, and L2O3, that you could see that uh, either, either, either position, the position of the, these SCMs will actually tell you what are the typical chemical composition that is there in these uh, uh, SCMs. So you could see that this fine limestone, it is, it is not an SNACM, but however, it is an act as a filler. It is basically on the CO mostly because it is a lot of CSCO3. Then the silica form is completely on SiO2. Then slag is somewhere on. Uh, in the, uh, the Portland cement, which has got more CAO compared to other SCMs, then you have slag, which, which is also have a pretty good amount of CAO. Where in the case of natural porcelain or material fires, does not have that much of CAO. As I said, SCMs are not hydraulic. It does not really react with the water. It requires some other kind of components to react. And now with that, we are going to see the next slides. As I said, the SCMs are typically aluminosilicates, aluminosilicates that you could see that in compared with the clinker, uh, the content of SiO2 or the presence of Al2O3 alumina is relatively high uh, uh, in, in, uh, in SCMs, whereas the CIO, the lime content is quite low in compared with the clinker. Well, slag is an exception. Slag has got a bit higher amount of CO. That eventually means that slag can actually react with water, but it is relatively really slow. Now, how does it react? How the uh, SCM, supplementary cementitious material, takes part in the binding process, or how does it act as a cementitious material? That we are actually going to see it in this one. Well, the silica, the silicate in supplementary cementitious material, as I said, that you know, the, the SCMs, all, all the SCMs actually contains a big portion of SiO2 phases. <laughs> the silica phase reacts with the calcium hydroxide in the cement or in the hydration products, added plus water, takes a bit of water and form CSH. As I said, the CH that has been formed due to the hydration of silicate phase, that means elite or belite. As I said earlier that, uh, when the silicate phase reacts, eliminate, sorry, uh, uh, LH or belate, it forms CSH plus CH, right? That CH reacts with the silica component in the SCM along with water, it forms for the CSH. As I said, the CH density is somewhere around 2.5, where the CH then CSH density is somewhere around 2. If you can actually, you are actually going to do a better efficiency, you know, better microstructure by having a low density hydration product. And that's how the uh, uh, supplementary cementitious material takes part in cement hydration and takes part in the in the binding and takes part in the strength development of the entire concrete or whatever be this material that we use it. But what does it have? What are the other advantages that we can act, that we will see when we use SCMs uh, in the cement or in the concrete? <laughs> One. Since it replaces, you can by using the supplementary cementitious material, you can actually replace us a portion of the clinker. As I said, you cannot completely replace the clinker because you really need CH to react the to for the SCM to react. With the CH will only come from the reaction of silicate, so you can only replace a portion of the clinker in the cement. But when you when you replace a portion of the cement, when you portion of the clinker in the cement, you are actually reducing the production cost. You are actually reducing the emission. You are actually reducing the use of natural resources. Right. Eventually, it actually improves the sustainability, and it also in, uh, it also increases the efficiency of the raw material. 
it can actually change the properties of the cement. It can actually change the properties of the concrete. For example, it, in the, when you look at the microstructure studies, uh, the CH uh, in a cement hydrogen, it generally forms in and around the aggregate. In and around the aggregate, it normally the CH deposits once the cement hydrates. And the in and around the aggregate, the space in and around the aggregate is typically called as ITZ or interfacial transition zone is the weakest part in the concrete. So the presence of ID is the one that actually defines the, the tensile strength of concrete. Since the, the, the concrete is really weak in tension, as you already know that, that's basically because of the presence of ID, so that's the weakest part in the concrete. So once you have the CH, once you can actually, once you put this SCMs in the concrete, what will happen is that the CH presence in and around this ITZ can actually form CSH and it can actually increase in the performance. It can actually do a better bonding or can reduce that. You can actually reduce the weakness of the ID set and put a better strength in that way. So you could actually change the properties of the cement in different ways. I am talking about the strength. When it comes out the uh, workability, I mean the fresh age properties. Workability is one such my criteria that the industry is really construction different look as far as the constructability is concerned, right? Uh, that actually depends upon the types of things that we really add it that we will see it later. Now let us look into each of these things. One is Palyash. That is quite common in India because we have a lot of uh, thermal power plants across the country. So we have a lot of flyers. And uh, as far as Indian concern, Indian code is concerned, we can actually replace up to 35 percent of the clinker can be replaced off, or the OPC can be replaced with the use of flyers. Uh, the flyers based uh, blended cement is typically called called as four than porcelain cement (PPC). You might have already heard about it. You might be already using it. And as far as India is concerned, we have sufficient amount of flyers. However, there is a huge variation of flyers, the quality of flyers in terms of its physical and chemical properties. It could be one big limitation as far as flyers is concerned. Then coming to the slag based cement, typically known as Portland slag cement or PFC. Since slag has got a higher amount of CAO present, we can actually go for the replacement level up to 70%. However, there are two aspect uh, limitations as far as slag based system is concerned. One, the rate of reaction of slag is quite low. So and that eventually means that the early age strength, typically the construction industry really look for the early age strength one day and three days things so they can go for desheltering and go for the higher stage of construction, right? Uh, that could be relatively low compared with OPC or PPC because the slag rate of reaction is quite slow. Then the, the amount of slag available in the country is not that high uh, because we don't have that much of uh, uh, the iron ore industry over here. Then <coughs> there is uh, silica fume based cement is also available in the market. Silica fume is basically from the silicon industry. Silica is extremely very, very fine particles. Uh, it's highly reactive because it's, it's, it's a very fine nature. And because of this extremely fine nature, it is also difficult to handle. It is extremely, it is extremely hazardous as far as health is concerned. However, its early strength is very high because it has, it has actually accelerated the hydration. It, it can actually accelerate the entire hydration process. But consequently, the water demand is will also become very high, or the water quality is going to be relatively low when you use silica fume over there. Then there is something called natural persona, which is not really common in India because we don't have an active volcano anywhere near within the country. So we don't we don't really we don't have that kind of natural persona based cements across the country. If you look at the total statics, it's, uh, it's about the 65 percentage of the current cement production is uh, Portland porcelainic cement, like gas waste. Then about 8% is porcelain slag cement. Then 24% is still we are using ordinary porcelain cement. And 3% is some other cement like super cyclic or high aggregate cement or what's what so Now oh, it's really important to look at the availability of SCMs and its usage. Silica foam is extremely low as far as its availability is concerned. Then comes natural porcelain. This is the global standard I'm talking about. Then there's a slag. However, most of the slag that has been produced has been actually used by the cement industry. Then comes flyers. 
although there is a quite a amount of fly ash is available across the world, even within India, but the usage of fly ash is quite low. Maybe you can say about 25% only. That's fundamentally because there are a couple of reasons. One, the prime reason is that the high variation, the lack of reliability of the properties of the fly ash is one prime concern. The second could be the available because although we have a lot of thermal power plants, there's hardly a thermal power near to Kerala or some location. The location based, it, it could be some difficulties faced for using the fly ash. And there is some other material that is called calcium clay. It's quite abundantly available. So the academy or the industry is actually keen to look at how calcium clay can be really used it as an ICO in cement so that we can actually reduce the natural resources. There comes, uh, there has been a recent research that has been active for the last five years for the development of a calcium clay based cement. Now let us look at what is calcium clay and how does it really process. Calcium clay is actually, is actually, uh, it's a process, it's a process the clay. You might be aware that clays could be a different types of uh, clay minerals are available, like elite, covalent, and monomer. Then you have a covalent clay, and then it decomposes or do the dehydroxylation process by heating up to somewhere around 700 degrees temperature. It dehydroxylates, it removes the structural water from the crystalline phases, it turns into amorphous phases or in a reactive phases, and that's how you get the calcium clay. And the dehydroxylation process is called the calcination. The process plus the material is called the calcium clay. You get, due to this calcination process, the crystalline non-reactive covalent clay transforms into amorphous metacovalin, which has which is been reactive. That has been, it becomes an ICM. It can actually react with CH. That is available, uh, that is actually from the uh, silicon hydrate. It becomes an ICM. But, I said there is a process involved to make the clay into reactive that is called calcination. So basically it's a simple process that heat them up to 650 to 70 degrees Celsius. Now you might be saying that, oh yes, there is a heating process there. There is an energy consumption is there. There is a little bit of emission is also there. However, when you look at, when you, if you can able to replace the clinger with it, there are two things. One, the process of clinger is directly emits CO2 where the calcination does not really in, uh, emit CO2 directly because it is just a dehydroxylation process. And second, the temperature is low. In, the terms, in terms of clinger production, the temperature is about 1,500 degrees Celsius, where this temperature is somewhere around 600 to 70 degrees Celsius. Now, <coughs> and using this calcium, they have been a, a recently developed a cement is currently in the market, especially in some of the, uh, some of the, uh, some of the countries abroad. And India recently has made a standard on it uh, for the production of limestone calcium clay cement. The typical composition of the cement is about 50% would be clinger and 30% would be calcium clay, 15% limestone and 5% gypsum uh, in terms of weight. And how does the synergy work in limestone calcium clay that we would look into that. When you look at the figure, you could see that there would be three main components in the cement that is clinger, calcium clay and limestone. And the clinker and calcium clay, since I said calcium clay can, is an ACM, it can react with CH in the cement. So there's a post landing reaction that has been happened between clinker and calcium clay. Then you have limestone and clinker. Well, the good thing with the limestone is that although we are actually <coughs> adding limestone without any process, without any clinker, it's as it is, limestone is a very fine particle when you grind it, by the way. The good thing is that uh, it's, it's spherical in nature. When you, have a, when you have a material that has been spherical in nature in cement, it can actually give a better workability because uh, you know its friction, the friction between particles would be reduced when you have a spherical particle in the cement. So it gives a better workability. Plus, it also acts as a filler. I will, I will talk about filler at the later stages. Then when you look at the uh, synergy between limestone and calcium clay, there is a, some kind of a new other hydration product that has been formed, and that is called carboaluminate phases. Again, a low density hydration products. So because of this three, the synergies into the synergy between these three components, you have a better micro, uh, denser microstructure when you use the limestone calcium clay cement, and it gives a better strength and a better durability. Now let us look into uh, how calcium clay and limestone actually contribute 
in the limestone calcium clay cement and its properties. As I said, calcium clay is a highly reactive alumina. Well, when you compare with the slag or fly ash, both the relatively slow reactive phases, I mean slow reactive HCMs, so the early age strength would be relatively low, very low in compared with OPC. But whereas if we use calcium clay, it is a high, it contains high reactive alumina. So that eventually means that your early age strength would be high or maybe even similar to OPC in compare with the when you compare with the fly ash or slag based cements. However, the presence of calcium clay can actually reduce the workability of the cement because it is not a spherical shape. It's an irregular in shape. It increases the friction between the particles. This also increases the workable. This also increases the water demand. So these are some of the disadvantages when I use calcium clay. But we have a limestone also, which can actually compensate the disadvantage of calcium clay when you use it in the cement. Now limestone, it can act when you when you put limestone in the cement, you can actually form a low density carboaluminate phases, which prevents aggregate to monosulfate. Aggregate to monosulfate conversion is a natural process that happens in the happens in the concrete. Uh, where the monosulfate is a relatively high density product compared to aggregate. When you add limestone in it, it this this conversion could be very low or it could be even avoided. Limestone, as I said earlier, that it will act as a filler. Since it is a spherical in nature, it can increase the workability. And then the good thing is that the limestone that we can actually use in limestone calcium and glass cement is actually the low grade limestone. The cement grade limestone, which is extremely pure, which is even our 90% the CSCO3 content, where in the case of the limestone that we can actually use in limestone calcium glass cement, the grade can be quite low. So we can actually use even marble dust. There is a lot of marble dust available in Dagestan area. This kind of materials we can actually use instead of limestone. <laughs> so overall, the usage of limestone, usage of calcium clay based cement, for example, in limestone calcium clay cement, uh, in short LC3 can actually reduce the CO2 emission. And it can actually reduce the, it can actually reduce the, the concept of natural resources. Its performance is comparable to OPC, particularly in terms of its early age strength. You have a better pore refinement because you have better, you have a denser, uh, denser microstructure due to the additional uh, hydration products such as carboaluminates. It has shown that it has a pretty good chloride attack, so it's quite good uh, to use it in the coastal areas and has got a higher strength. More, you can actually check for the more details in the website www.lc3.ch. <coughs> so now let us look at the second aspect that uh, can we improve the efficiency of the clinger? As I said earlier, that when you add the clinger, when the hydration happens, let us say over the years, it maybe you can expect around 60 to 70 percent of the clinger only actually hydrates. It does not hydrate more. Let us see the reason and how what is this filler effect to increase the efficiency of the clinger. In the figure, you can see that there is a the the red the uh, the the red circle that uh, represents the unhydrated clinger phases. So it could be allied or it could be allied or it could be something else. When the hydration happens. The hydration products, the main hydration product that is CSH, forms in and around the uh, 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 in and around the uh, clinger phases. Remember, it is not as in reality. This is not really in a spheric. It, it will be like a spherical shape. So it will be in and around the uh, uh, particle. Correct. So when you add a filler here, the filler material represents with the yellow color. When you add a filler, what happens is that this hydration products will act also forms in and around the filler material also. The thing is that in the early duration of the hydration, this hydration products, I mean the green particle, I mean the green portion is highly porous. So that means uh, the water particle can actually penetrate inside it and can act as a, can, uh, uh, you know, you really require water to hydrate further, right? So when this, uh, in the early ages, the, 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 the precipitate, the hydration product that is CHS has been highly porous. You get a lot of water inside and you can actually, uh, you know, continues the hydration. But whereas <coughs> over the ages, this hydration products become salt phase and then uh, it stops the penetration of the water inside it and it stops the, the further hydration of the clinger. So that's how you want, you would never get a 100% clinger efficiency in reality. But when you add the filler, what happens is that 
a portion of the hydration products actually tends to precipitate in and around the filler also so that eventually means that you have a better a longer duration for the for the uh, water penetration to stop and you can actually emphasize further more hydration of the clinker and that's how you increase the efficiency of the clinker hydration and this is called this particular uh, uh, process is called filler effect you add a material that is preferably finer than the clinker pieces finer than the cement although it does not really react directly or even indirectly it can actually act as a surface for the growth for the precipitation and growth of the hydration products that can actually improve the efficiency of the clinger hydration <coughs> the typical uh, uh, the typical uh, filler material is limestone because limestone we can actually ground into very fine particles we can also add sand that is fine but our only thing is that you really need to uh, make it really fine then only the actual filler effect will come up the good thing is that you can actually improve the early age strength properties because you are actually accelerating the hydration so once you add a bit of fly a bit of limestone very fine particle you are really strength the tend to increase it in the uh, tend to increases you have a better rheological properties a better workability since you add a fine limestone in it which is spherical in nature if you look at the european cements even up to 30% of the limestone is can be added depending upon the condition depending upon the usage of the cement and this is highly this is has highly been used in self combating self combating concrete or acc coming to the third way of approach that is can we change can we have can we address the challenges by changing the production process the production process of opc let us look into that and then there is something called a belayed rich cement that we will see it when you look at the clingerization process as i said that uh, you have, when the cement comes that the, there will be a dehydration zone that starts from 450 degrees celsius and over the over the time period the temperature increases from 450 to 1500 degrees celsius and then in the beginning the, the water evaporates then the clay decomposes limestone decomposes when you increase the temperature further you have the formation of the c2s at the beginning at the temperature is somewhere around 1200 degrees celsius and then you increase further the temperature you the formation of c3s happens okay so that eventually means that the formation of c3s requires high energy it's formed only at the higher temperature side but if you look at only c2s remember both are silicate phases one is c2s and one is c3s both are silicate phases both are silicate phases but if you look at what what will happen if you if it does not really react i know increase the temperature to 1500 degrees celsius you only keep it somewhere in 1200 or 1250 most of your cement component would be c2s rather than c3s the good thing is that you are actually saving a lot of energy from the, the reducing the temperature and you form c2s which has got a lower cao component compared with the c3s almost 1 by 3 can be reduced that eventually means that you are actually reducing the amount of limestone cso3 as a raw material by 1 by 3 and it also means that uh, uh, you have a cement which have a low heat of hydration the heat of hydration of the cement is one one parameter that is very critical that is very uh, uh, so, you know mainly root cause of the may, may, uh, durability issues as far as concrete structure is concerned so when you build a structure with velite rich cements or c2 rich cement its heat of hydration uh, when you, the, you know as heat of hydration in the sense when you add water there's a lot of heat generation due to the hydration reaction right so that heat of hydration is quite low in uh, in compare with uh, in compare with the typical opc when you in uh, so so that can actually significantly reduce when you have a belayed rich cements so as i said belayed rich cement, what we do is that we don't we are not really changing the entire process instead of keeping it the 1500 degrees celsius we reduce a bit of in a lower side and assume that uh, to look forward uh, for the production of 
high bellatrix cement as i said in the beginning that c3 is typically forms around 80 to 90 percent of the cement composition right so we reduce it we reduce it and mainly focus on the higher bellet traces the good thing is that we can actually reduce the limestone content in there we can also reduce the uh, uh, temperature the clinker temperature also and thus we can actually reduce the emission of co2 when you look at well, this has been actually quite been used it over there. For example, uh, the the Hoover Dam that is there in the Colorado River of Arizona State, it's actually made up of a bellite rich cement. As I said, it is quite good in uh, in, a, in a massive concrete because it produces a very low heat. Then, is there any alternative for cement? Well, there is quite research is happening nowadays. The one such thing that you need to talk about is the geopolymer or geopolymer is cement. But this is, you can't really say it as a cement. Uh, no, it's you can, you could probably call it as a binder rather than say it as a cement because it's basically, you have an alumina rich material. It could be metacarbonate, it could be fly ash, or it could be somewhere, something else that is basically typically alumino silicates. And then you add an alkali activator, a chemical in it. It could be like sodium or potassium, but the soil alkali silicate, so kind of solutions. And then it reacts with this albina, albina silica rich material, albina silicates, and forms a kind of a polymerization process happening, which has got a high binding capability, and it acts like a binder. So you can actually tell that uh, a concrete with the geopolymer type of material, you can actually you can tell the concrete without a cement. Typically, call it as because it's, you can't really call it as a cement. It is basically a binder. And there has been a lot of research is happening. There is a lot of usage is happening, particularly US about this geopolymer. It basically on the three component. One is there is an alumino silicate component, an alumino silicate material. It could be calcium clay, kaolin clay, or ash, or slag, fly ash, whatever. Then you have a chemical that is typically on alkaline reagents, and it it reacts with this alumino silicate basis and put a lot of polymerization process, even a complex polymerization, which has got a high binding capability in the presence of water. Then there is an another research is continuously happening on municipal solid waste based cement or a binder material. It has been happening happening a lot in Europe because they really want to get rid of the you know uh, the municipal solid waste. If you look at uh, in in uh, in uh, I'm not really sure about which area in Kerala there are a lot of municipal solid waste has been dumping over there and and the, and the government or they then they're. Uh, you know, the authority is really trying hard to what we can actually use it. So there has been a lot of research has happening. There was a breakthrough also that how we can actually use the municipal solid waste and convert into a binder material, and that can be used in concrete. And in fact, this uh, the in fact in Japan is actually started the production of uh, municipal solid waste uh, uh, based uh, binder material. But there is an another problem is that it it uh, it has a lot of presence of the chloride and dioxins. Uh, so having it in reinforced concrete is still a dilemma. Still a lot of research need to happen whether it can be actually used in the reinforced concrete because it could actually lead a lot of corrosion, a lot of issues to the steel. But when we use, as we have seen it, that there are different types of approaches. We could use a different types of material. We could have different types of process. And then you have a new set of challenges that you would expect by developing all these areas. Let us see what are the new kind of challenges that industry could probably going to face it because this will actually lead to further research potentials. One thing is one such thing is that the variation of raw material properties. As I said that in the beginning, when you use convention, when we use only OPC, I mean it is relatively clear. I mean its hydration reaction is really clear. You don't have that much of variation because your raw material composition, your 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 raw material is only two. That is limestone and clay, its chemical composition is well defined, it's well clear. So it's really understandable, it is well established. But when you use a lot of other materials, when you change the process, or when we use some kind of chemicals in it, then we could probably face a new set of challenges. One such thing is that the size, the size of the external materials such as SCM, that how does it really matter? Its size and shape that could potentially potentially influence the hydration reaction as well as the early uh, fresh shape, fresh properties as well as the hardened properties. Then its shape, as I said, that the spherical shape could actually increase the workability. <coughs> Where the non-spherical shape of the particle could significantly reduce the workability and in, in increase the water demand. 
then the chemical composition could influence the entire hydration process and the properties of the cement and the concrete the presence of impurities could lead to a big larger issues that you as far as the durability is concerned uh, as far as india is concerned as i already told you that the uh, although we produce about 174 million ton per year its utilization is only 25 percent basically because of this kind of variations in the material and its physical and chemical properties now let us look into the various fresh properties that can influence by these kind of materials as i said earlier that it is not consistent it cannot be constant it depends upon the material property it can do the type of the material it also depends upon the physical and chemical properties of the material for example when you look at the water demand the fly ash and slag can actually reduce the water demand whereas the silica film or carcinic like can actually increase the water demand then there comes workability <laughs> well of course when the water requirements are low that eventually means that the workability is going to be high then there is something called bleeding and segregation it could actually change depending upon the material depending upon the rate uh, how much percent what is the replacement rate and everything then the heat of hydration the one such thing is the setting times so all these things really matter when you add when you add an additional material or a supplementary additional material or a filler material in the cement or in the concrete and again coming to the hardened properties the strength gain or the permeability or ascally silica reaction or chemicals all these things can actually potentially vary the one fact is that it is or many of the times it is not only in one direction it could either increase or it could either decrease so this is something that need to be really worried about or this is something that need to be uh, that that the industry need to be really careful when they go for you know uh, uh, critical construction with the using uh, uh, using uh, this kind of additional material over there so that eventually means uh, okay there has been research has been happened a lot with how uh, this uh, the presence of uh, cementitious material or presence of this new kind of formation of the cement can influence uh, can be influenced by external factors for example this is one study shows the influence of curing temperature on uh, the performance of the blended cements or the performance of the uh, cements that has been based in supplementary cementitious material uh this this remember these are temperature typically an, an ambient temperature that in india you can in some of the places north you can actually get a 10 degree celsius in rajasthan area in summer you'll get 50 degree celsius uh, during the summer time right so this this temperature is actually can actually occur when you cure, when you cure the, cure the concrete in an ambient condition depending upon the season this temperature can be the uh, real the real the practical temperature that can actually happen in india now let us compare with uh, uh, three different cements f3 c3 and s3 that means f4 fly ash c4 calcium clay and s4 slag now you look at a three different temperature the strength i'm only talking about the strength here just in the case of fly ash bank a 30% of opc has been replaced with and 30% of the clinger that has been replaced with the fly ash the blend shows a gradual increase in strength when you increase the temperature fine it's okay but in the case of calcium clay when you look at it when you reduce the temperature its later age strength is significantly high it's very high at the later stage however when the, when the temperature goes up the strength gain is drastically reduced so this eventually means that uh, in the blended system in a blended cement system there is a significant influence of curing temperature also which we really need to be bothered or which we need to, which we need to consider when we do the design and usage as i said that the replacement level replacement level can be varied for example here we saw that in the second picture on the bottom line we could see that the two different blends f5 indicates the 45% has been replaced with the fly ash and f3 indicates 30% has been replaced with the fly ash when we look at it at 10 per at 10 degrees celsius sorry with 27 degrees celsius the performance is relatively on the similar at a later stage as far as the compressive strength development is concerned but at the higher temperature you could see that the this the per the, the strength gain or the rate of strength gain is quite low or even significantly there is quite low when you increase the clinger con when you increase the replacement level from 30 percent to 45 percent with the flyers so this also indicates that it's just not the type of material it the replacement level can also influence us by external factors such as temperature now when you look at the temperature does it uh, which i mean uh, can we overcome this temperature influences well there is an another study that has been shown that the air the 
the early edge temperature is the one that is really critical as you could see that here in p5 uh, uh, the first sample that shows it the sample has been kept at 50 degree right from the day one where uh, the second the second bar diagram shows the sample has been kept to 50 degree right from day two so there is a one day delay in it and you can see that there's a significant strength in 28 day strength so that eventually means that the, the temperature influence can actually overcome by just by delaying the influence of temperature by one day so this means that it could be always beneficial that when we use for a uh, you know that uh, high replacement high clinger replacement type of cements it is always preferred to do the concrete in a low temperature um, low temperature ambient condition let us say maybe in the night the night concrete would be preferred or maybe uh, sometime when you don't have the temperature it's crossing 45 degrees celsius or maybe you need to have some kind of setup where you cross the temperature where the ambient curing temperature goes 45 degrees celsius only after one day of concreting so this kind of things you, this kind of remedial measures that you can actually take to overcome this kind of uh, adverse effects now there is something again that we need to look at is the steel reinforcement how this presence of uh, you know scms or some kind of materials can actually influence uh, affect uh, the steel reinforcement and of course you know the steel reinforcement pretty matters about is the corrosion right and as far as corrosion of steel reinforcement is concerned in general in an opc conditions once we put it the concrete is typically an alkaline solution so we have a passive layer that has been formed in and around the steel bar which passive layer in the sense uh, iron hydroxide so this actually forms further corrosion of steel bar and actually act as a protective cover it's a protective layer a passive layer but when you add scms in the cement with a higher replacement level that eventually means that the alkaline content of the ph of the solution is actually reducing it basically what will happen is that ch in other words calcium hydroxide ca or it's twice and this calcium hydroxide that has been consumed by the silicate bases that is present in the scm which eventually reduce the alkaline content in this in the concrete that could potentially lead to the uh, you know the uh, the, alk the alkalinity of the concrete that eventually leads to the destruction of this passive layer at a very later stages so this process is called uh, uh, i mean uh, this uh, so there is another way that this carbonation process uh, that eventually actually binding the calcium uh, 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 carbon dioxide outside carbon dioxide so in the in the beginning you have the clinger process which emits the carbon dioxide outside then in the last you have a process called carbonation which actually takes the carbonation from outside from the atmosphere so there is it's a reverse process correct but however the system does it it is a really really slow process it takes hundreds of years to reach this carbonation process let us say about 30 mm size so it is relatively fine as long as you have you kept uh, the cover is somewhere around uh, it's quite sufficient cover you have been kept it so that eventually means that when you use an scm based cement or a high the higher replacement you would also need to be think about uh, the design part the structural design part you may need to keep a bit of higher cover for the reinforcement structures so these are the things that we need to look at uh, uh, when we use a uh, different types of high versatile types of materials as a binding material then we need to go for a higher quality control of the cement cement is material typically we use mortar compressor strength or lime test uh, as far as opc is concerned to understand the quality of the cement curve but when you have all these different types of material well, typical just a compressive strength may not be sufficient to understand the performance. You will have to go for isothermal calorimetry to understand the hydration kinetics of the hydration kinetics, the heat rate of the cement. You will have to go for the X-ray diffraction, which to identify the characterization of the raw material, which to identify the phase changes, what is happening at a higher temperature or what is happening when you go for a different types of material. Is there any inner chemical reaction that has been, is there a new phase that has been formed that is potentially dangerous for duration that is potentially dangerous as far as durability is concerned. So these things, you need to have a better quality control, sophisticated equipment to go for a more test. Then you will have to look for the use of admixtures. As I said, that some of the SIMs can increase the workability, whereas some of the SIMs can actually reduce the workability and increase and ask for a more water. So you probably need to go for a 
uh, a lot more admixtures. You may need to develop a new admixtures and things like that. So these are the some areas that has been highly researched in our days, the development of new types of admixtures so far, because you have a lot of new materials that is coming up in the cement industry. This eventually means that uh, there's a lot of standardization is required. You know, if you look at the BIA standard in cement itself, there could be you could see a lot more standards that has been happened in our in, 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 in the recent years. You have OPC standard, your PPC standard, your limestone cast and glass cement, your slag standard of the different type of cement. You have different variations. And there, are, there are a lot more standards. And people might, you know, uh, the, the the construction industry may be a little reluctant to use all these things and they simply go for OPC sometimes, but which is not really good for the, as far as the, you know, the sustainability or the emission is concerned. <clears throat> so we have seen uh, uh, the challenges the industry is currently facing it. Uh, we have seen uh, the emission issues. We have seen the environmental issues. We have seen the you know lack of resources, we, uh, lack of sufficient resources to meet the future demand. We also seen that the cement industry took a lot more energy. And how do we address these challenges? We have seen the different approaches. I mean, uh, by replay, can we replace the clinger? Yes, we can replace the clinger with the supplementary cement additional material. Can we change the production process to address the challenges? Yes, we could have a bit of change of uh, changing the production process and go for belayed rich cements, for example. And can we increase the performance of the clinger, a better efficient clinger, clinger, uh, I mean clinger hydration? Yes, we could. You could use a filter effect, or we can actually go for additional grinding of the clinger to make the clinger more fine, so that it can increase the clinger, uh, you know, uh, clinger efficiency further more. But then there is an energy consumption there also. Then is there an alternative form? And yes, there are a lot of research that has been happening in that area. For example, the development of the geopolymers. So these are the things that we need. Once we look at the linear approach for to address the challenges, reduce the CO2 for the clinger production. Yes, that is quite possible. But there are a lot of methods, but reduce the clinger in cement. Well, we have seen the SCMs in the cement. Okay, quite fine. Or maybe using the filler also. Reduce the cement in concrete. Well, maybe a better uh, mixed design and optimal basis on a performance based the mixed design can actually reduce the cement in concrete. Then reduce the concrete in building. Well, uh, maybe having a better structural design. Uh, you know, a better structure design. Uh, you could actually reduce the the, the you know the, the volume of the concrete that has been used that has, that is required in the building construction can actually reduce, or more efficient use of buildings. Well, maybe you could use a recycled aggregate, or maybe better efficient architecture design, or maybe using the building at all and gone for stone age. There could be different types of linear approaches to reduce the overall consumption of the cement by the construction industry. I hope that. I'm able to convey uh, some messages as far as the cement industry, uh, its process, its challenges, and opportunities is concerned. Uh, I hope you enjoy my sessions and thank you. And we could go for the discussion. Hello. Thank you, sir. Dear participants, now you can interact with our expert. Uh, just a second, let me. Uh, I can't okay, see sir, you guys. Sir. Just a second, let me. Let me okay, uh, okay, sir. Okay, sir. Go back to. Okay. Yeah. Sir, I have a question. Sure. Uh, so uh, you have. To, uh, Explain the lime, calcium, the clay yes. uh, in the manufacture of cement. Uh, what about adding these two materials uh, to the OPC for uh, project works to students? Is it possible uh, or will it give the result? Oh, yes, because you see, uh, as I said, that I see a composition, right? In the composition that has been mentioned, that the typical composition is 50% clinger and 30% calcium clay and 15% limestone then 5% gypsum in the case of opc i mean opc the typical opc uh, the composition would be about a 95% clinger and maybe 5% or 5 to 3% gypsum so of course you can add you can replace a, a portion of the opc <coughs> when you, like a portion of the opc with the either calcium clay alone or you can take both calcium clay and limestone. But the thing is that limestone you can actually get it anywhere. But calcium clay, I'm not really sure that whether you how you are actually going to get it. You may need to check with the industry that uh, because there is no there is no industry that has been actually giving calcium clay. That's what I think. 
or you can go for one thing that uh, there is something called metacarbolin the difference between metacarbolin and calcinoclay is that in metacarbolin it is about um, it's a 90 95% pure metacarbolin where in the case of calcinoclay it is about 65% only metacarbolin so you could either purchase metacarbolin from the industry because that is quite available there are agencies that sell metacarbolin in it and the limestone I'm not really sure about whether you will actually can buy limestone directly because all the limestone that we get is really, uh, you know, it's extremely in a good grade. Or you can just get a limestone anywhere and then you can make it really fine and use it in the cement. I mean, use it in the OPC. Basically, replace the OPC with the content of calcium clay alone or calcium clay plus limestone. Both are fine. It's for the research, right? So it is quite fine. So uh, you mean to say that uh, lime itself is enough? Uh, in its no. power, more powdered form lime, rather than using the uh, non available calcium clay. Lime is fine. Lime is nothing with CAO. It's fine. I mean, but, but uh, uh, then you really the thing don't. Is that, mm. The thing is that metacarbolin is costly compared to the yeah. other uh, SCMs. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, we'll not prefer that, uh, especially as projects. So, uh, I agree. Yeah. Yes, sir. See, the, 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 uh, see, the thing is that, uh, see, lime is CH, right? Correct. Yes, lime yes. Is hydroxide, whereas calcium clay is a clay thing. It's aluminosilicates. I mean, the purpose both are really different. I mean, when you want, you mean to say that you want to do a research lime plus calcium clay, that is quite fine. Because... Okay. Uh, the calcium is actually reacted with the CS content in the cement that is lime. Okay. All right. I mean, okay. you cannot use CS instead of calcium lime because the purpose is really, really different. Okay. 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 Okay, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Participants, any more questions? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Am I audible? Yes. 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 Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, thank you for the, such a informative session, uh, sir. Actually, I am uh, I am a session professor at uh, in SVKM's IOT Dhule, and currently I am working on a project which is a uh, self compacting concrete, like hybridization of fibers in self compacting concrete, right, sir? So, uh, like you you also talked about some microstructural characteristics like uh, uh, some of the characterization of concrete of cement right sir so mm. what do you suggest me to go for what kind of uh, microstructural parameters to be analyzed for my self compacting concrete which is i am using hybridization of fibers in that in that i'm so i'm sorry the last word is uh, hybridization of fibers in self compacting concrete so what what do you suggest uh, for what kind of microstructural parameters i should go for what type of microstructural parameters you should go for? See, as far as, as uh, self-compacting concrete is concerned, the major parameter that we are actually looking for, workability and flowability, without yes, any sir. segregation, am I right? Yes, sir. All right. So, so that is the one that prime parameter to define a fresh concrete to be self-compacting concrete. So yes, as sir. far as microstructure is concerned, that is actually happening after the hardened state, I mean, during the hardened state. I mean, we yes, don't sir. really study the microstructure during a fresh property stage. I mean, fresh stage. Yes, sir. Correct. It's only yes, at the sir. hardened stage. So I don't think at the hardened stage, there is nothing special for SEC. Yes, there is nothing so special on the SEC. Your voice is breaking. Special. Hello? Yes, sir. Yeah. See, as far as SEC is uh, SEC alone concerned, there is nothing special for to study the microstructure. You can study the microstructure as far as the durability of SCC is concerned. You could you could look at you could look at how much porous this thing because uh, most of the SCC I think we reduce these uh, the aggregate uh, size, correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, yes, and go sir. for a bit more uh, finer material. Some days yes, it could be a really an advantage. So this kind of uh, you can actually do a microstructure study just not for SEC to compare the microstructure development and microstructure properties in compare with the typical concrete or a typical, you know, the typical mixed design or whatever it is. There is nothing like a special for microstructural uh, study only for SEC. You can have a comparative study because as far as SEC is concerned, the major properties that controls 
or to define SAC is is all comes in the first stage, not on the hardened stage. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. No, my question is sir, like uh, what kind of parameters I should go for to uh, to analyze the durability parameters of micro like self compacting concrete. Oh yeah. As yeah, I am okay, using hybridization. Okay. Of fine, fine, fine. Uh, have you heard about MIP? MIP. Yes, yeah. sir. You might have heard about it, right? Yes, sir. Mercury intrusion porosimetry that you can go for it. Then you can go for an, uh, uh, the scanning electron microscopy analysis. Okay. So one okay, will sir. give the chemical. One will give the chemical nature of the uh, the microstructure, and the other will give the physical nature of the microstructure. Both are in terms of durability concerns. The one such para the extra, uh, one such parameter that the durability is concerned that it's porosity. Correct. Yes, it's, sir. It's the nature yes, of both, sir. both the connectivity as well as the you know that uh, the volume. So this thing yes, you can yeah. actually do it sir. through uh, is, uh, doing an MIP study. Okay, sir. Okay, okay, sir. Okay. But thank you so much. Sir. Doing an MIP is a bit because you are using mercury. I am not really sure that uh, whether this facility is available. Well, it is available in India. You may need to look for. No, actually, it is not available in, at my institute. So I'll be I'll have to go for outsourcing. So I'm looking for some laboratories and uh, like who can provide me some these yeah. tests. So if anyone anyone out there can uh, suggest me any name name of any laboratory, so that I can approach them, please let me know. I am Achal Agrawal. You are from? From Maharashtra, sir. Bhule. Maharashtra. Yes, sir. Uh, I think it would be there in a national. Uh, yes, sir. NCB. NCB. In NCB. Uh, Haryana. Okay. Okay, it sir. It must be there. Yeah. Then, okay, sir. Um, then IIT Madras, it is there, I think. Okay, sir. Actually, sir, uh, it is uh, it serb serb uh, Chennai, CSIR serb. It is available there, yes, yes, but uh, yeah. yes, sir. I I contacted there uh, with one of the scientists, but she refused. She said they are not uh, allowing any outs uh, uh, like any student uh, or anyone out out from the from their like uh, serb. Mm -hmm. So I cannot. Reach there, but I contacted mm. one of the uh, like scientists there, but they denied. Mm. So I am looking for something. IIT IIT uh, IIT Madras, right, sir? IIT Madras, it is there in the department. It is there. Okay, so okay, okay, okay. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any more questions from the participants? I hope that uh, there are no more questions. Then I think we can move on to the vote of thanks. Any more questions from the participants? Sir, I have one question. Yeah, ah, yes. you, can, you can also ask the general question. Also. There is something that we need to stick to the topic. Sir, yeah, my question is related. Yeah. But your voice is relatively low. Can you increase the voice a bit? Okay, sir. Okay, uh, my yeah. question is related to um, one. Uh, my B Tech students has uh, their project, B Tech project. Okay, so uh, uh, actually they have designed for an M20 grade concrete, uh, but uh, after casting, immediately uh, the state declared the lockdown. Okay, uh, so uh, they were able to test it after only 86 days, okay, instead of 28 days. Okay. But uh, the strength we found that after testing, um, it, uh, uh, we are, we expected around uh, 35 MPA like that, but we got it around uh, about 50 MPA after 86 days. So can you explain mm -hmm. this? What is the phenomenon behind that? What is the sir, is it clear, sir? Yeah, it's clear. Is it a PPC? Or you have no idea about this cement. I need to tell what kind of cement it could be. Uh, OPC, OPC cement, sir. It's OPC. OPC. Okay, fine. The, see, the reason is that uh, uh, so you expect, so I will put it in a generic mode, okay, rather than on a specific board. If you expect a higher 
compressive strength at late trades more than what you expect. So that is what the scenario here, as far as I understand. So it could be basically a belayed rich cement, or it could be the belayed content of the cement would be relatively high compared to a con normal OPC. The reason, if it is a C3, is con if C3 is content is high, you will have a you will have an early age strength. Let us say the strength probably uh, until seven days. That strength would be really high. Then the rate of strength would be relatively really slow. But when you have the belayed content in it, in a in a, in a, in, a, in a higher composition rather than typical. Your early strength would be relatively low, but your later strength after 28 days, it's going to be really high. So that could be something that can happen here. Or else, if it is not OPC, there is another reason. In PPC, typically it happens. If in PPC or PC, it really is happened. Uh, it, it's quite common that you get a better strength. Uh, you get a strength that is much higher than what you really expect. After 28 days, if you test for 90 days, you can actually significantly increase the strength as far as PPC is concerned, or even slag is concerned. So since you said that it is OPC, that could be the reason that the belayed content of the cement would be slightly high, or maybe even much high. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. It is clear, sir. Well, on a general set, on a general sense, I would tell one thing. See, uh, uh, in a quite common way, I and mean, people who have no idea about the water cement and concrete and things like that, there is one thing that you all can specify is that uh, the first uh, one day uh, temperature, if you can keep below 45 degrees, that is extremely beneficial, whatever be the cement, or PC, PPC, or whatever it is. Then, over the first three days of the curing, it is really critical. It, if we can actually take care of the curing of the first three days, that is quite sufficient. As far as OPC or PPC or even PS is concerned, quite sufficient in the sense that is critical. I mean, basically, uh, when you when you look at people, you know, this kind of uh, simple requirements or a simple condition that if you can communicate to the general public, it's actually going to be really beneficial as far as the uh, durability for as for sustainability of uh, the construction is concerned. Bindya uh, Madam was trying to say something, I think. No, sir, I was listening, sir. Yeah, okay. <laughs> then people say always, you know, typically uh, ask, since you belong to the civil engineering uh, domain, uh, the public generally ask you what kind of cement you really want to use it. Always they get the confusion, right? And if you look at this, uh, the people choose the cement in, in uh, basically in two parameters. One, the kind of advertisements. Second, the color. The more the gray, they think that the more is more good. Or the more strength, it is going to be more. That that's not really the case because strength anyway, whatever be the cement that has been happening, Ramco or Ultra Tapo, whatever be the cement it guarantees, it can actually going to happen. You can even go for a cheaper cement. There is nothing wrong in that. As for long as you are you are, take, you are actually taking care about this, you know, the, the early age, I mean post a three day uh, the curing process or whatever. Then second thing is that uh, uh, the construction people are concerned. They add um, water in, you know, when they feel that, okay, the cement is not really workable. That's one big problem that is going to be faced as far as durability is concerned. Common generic or amateur perspective, some sort of take away and then we take away and then we take away and then we highly technical. Mindful of please speak English. Oh, yeah, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, I did not realize that. Yeah, sorry, yeah, my mistake. Sorry, sorry for those who don't understand Malayana. Okay, fine. What I really want to say is that ultimately we all belong to the civil engineering domain. So that eventually means that there will be a lot of people, the general public, the common people ask a lot of questions. What kind of cement that you need to select that? What kind of cement that we need to select? That's what that's one typical question that generally we receive it from the, uh, in the public domain. To my personal opinion, it is completely fine. And for this kind of, you know, the, the simple, small scale construction you can take any cement you can go for a cheaper cement that is nothing wrong in that 
of them as you take over the, the early age uh, properties like uh, during the first stage as well as the hydration the first three days of hardening i think it is quite completely fine that you can you can use any cement as far as its grade is okay. i mean the grade of Sorry for the disturbance. Then, that is fine. That's when it happens. And then there's something other thing that we generally get is that, uh, you know, in typical in in in, in, in the general public when they do the concrete, when they feel that the concrete is not really workable, they they add a bit of water again. After some time, they'll add matter again, over and over again, to make the mix more workable. So this is one parameter that really controls the durability. That is really going to affect the durability of the concrete. So when you look at, especially in Kerala, that I've seen it that the general tendency is that people spend a lot of time and money to uh, look at uh, uh, look at this uh, uh, the beautification of the building. Let us say their hope, for example, tiles or maybe marbles or maybe the utilities, maybe other external fixtures like kitchen and things like that. They spend a lot of time and money for that. But they're very, very reluctant to spend time, money or even care that for the two things that is really important. One for the planning, because people are really hard to spend money for the planning, uh, for the planning people. I mean, be the architect or be a typical civilian or diplomat, whoever it is. They don't really want to spend for the planning one. OK, fine. As for Second thing is that they hardly take care about the concrete. And concrete is one such essential thing that actually makes, you know, uh, let us imagine that you you build a home and within two years it started, uh, uh, the water started percolating it. Once the water started percolating it, then you have to go for other other repairment work, which is going to cost a lot. You may need to put a, some other facility that the water need, want to, should not come over there. Then it can actually, you know, lead to the end, you know, a particular area to be completely collapsed. There, it all happened. Basically, people don't really care about when they do concreting. This is something that we need to focus. I mean, in a general public is concerned, you will have to tell them that you know, using put, putting more and more water is not at all good, and putting a more and more cement is also not at all good. There is a you know, we have got clearly specified that the maximum content of the cement, even right now, because it is all in a prescriptive based mix design is the problem. Now, I think government of India is trying hard to change the performance based the cement. If that comes, the cement content is actually going to reduce a lot. Uh, because people have the tendency that okay, you you put more cement, you are actually going to get a better concrete. That is completely wrong. Thank you, sir. In any more questions from the participants? Matthew, sir, can we move on to the vote of thanks? Oh. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I welcome Professor Divya S. Nair for the vote of thanks. William, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are clear. clearly audible. I am privileged to deliver vote of thanks to this session. There is a famous Japanese proverb, better than a thousand days of diligent study is one day with a great leader. Yes, you sir, sir, your two hour session makes it true. I would like to thank the expert for today's session, Dr. Arun C. Emmanuel for enlightening us with your knowledge and sharing your findings with us. It gives deep insight into the topics manufacturing of cement, challenges in the construction industry, corrosion of steel reinforcement, etc. Sir concluded the session with some approaches for addressing these challenges by using supplementary cementitious material, belite rich cement, geopolymers are better alternative for cement, etc. So with all, I thank you, sir, for this wonderful session. On behalf of Department of Civil Engineering, I once again thank you for uh, giving this uh, wonderful and interesting topic. Thank you, sir.
thank you thank you once again for giving me the opportunity to speak up thank you thank you all i think uh, i can leave the meeting right yeah okay sir